Okay, so um, as Tarun said, this is your last day, um, and we may or may not meet again, each other again, but I wish you all the best. And I will say one thing for you guys that you're know, the most IT savvy of all the, the previous years that I've come across in the sense that you'll ask me the least amount of questions. You all seem very comfortable with the software. So now it's about just going and exploring and, and, and doing cases and reporting them. Um, and hopefully everything will, will proceed smoothly. So my talk today really is about pericardium and cardiac masses and really it's not about knowing everything about the pericardium and cardiac masses in, in 15 minutes or 20 minutes. It's really about an approach. And this is something that I think um, Tarun and I have been um, hammering home all this while and in the last six days or so is that you need to have a systematic approach. Follow that through. Over the years you will evolve, you will modify that approach, but have a basic stepwise approach. One, two, three, four. You know, your mind should just keep um, working as, as you come across an issue. So really, this talk is to hone in on the fact that the coronaries are important, but you need to look at things outside of the coronaries as well. And that is why sometimes we even suggest that we look at the lungs and the bones first. Look at, I mean, I look at the heart first, um, look at the lungs and bones, and then go to the coronaries. That's the last thing I go to. This is just to make sure that I've covered all aspects of it. And what we will do is look at some of the common pericardial abnormalities and make you aware of some of the common cardiac masses. So, um, Tarun's already talked about this. Your pericardium is a very thin layer, and essentially it consists of um, two layers that are stuck together. And you don't really see them as two separate layers because it, it, anatomically it's just one single layer unless there's some abnormality. And so this single layer out here is the pericardium which is labeled as B. So it's like a sharp pointy pencil and you draw a line around the heart, so that's your pericardium. Fat, as you remember, is supposed to be dark gray, so anything within that pericardial uh, layer is called the epicardial fat, and these vessels are the coronary vessels. So essentially they're called epicardial vessels because they run the epicardial fat um, within the pericardium. And then outside of it is the paracardiac fat, and this is the one that sometimes fools us as radiologists, and I'm sure the radiologists understand that. Uh, when you have a chest x-ray, you sometimes find what looks like a, an opacity on the right or the left cardiophrenic angle. That's really a lot of extra cardiac, uh, sorry, a lot of paracardiac fat. And the pericardium is just a thin line, but when you get fluid within it, you kind of split up the two layers. So this is really an MR, just trying to highlight the fact that there are two layers, and then when you get fluid between the two layers is when you see it very well. You tend to see the pericardium very well when it's thickened or calcified as well. So essentially the normal thickness is meant to be up to four, up, at least on autopsy is meant to be up to two millimeters, but what is considered abnormal is generally four or more millimeters thickness of the pericardium. And the smallest amount of fluid that you can detect on CT is about 10 mils. And there are a number of things that can affect the pericardium, and this is just a, a medical school list of all the things that can affect the pericardium, ranging from infectious to immune to inflammatory, neoplasia, radiation-induced, trauma, post-cardiac surgery, idiopathic. And these are some of the things that you keep in mind and you correlate with the clinical history when you're coming to um, some sort of conclusion about the pericardium. So essentially this is a thickened pericardium. As you can see, it's not that thin, sharp pointed pen pencil line, drawing a line around the heart. This is actually a really blunt pencil. So this is a thickened pericardium. And when you get thickened pericardium, generally, as I said to you, if it's more than or equal to four millimeters, we consider that to be thickened pericardium. So if someone's got a history of chest pain and, you know, they, the, um, if they've done a coronary angiogram and if it's normal, they usually come down saying that, you know, rule out myopericarditis. And if you were to do a CT on it, not that you would do a CT as a preferential choice, but if you were to do a CT on it, what you would find is a thickened pericardium. And that may be part of suppurative or non-suppurative pericarditis. You can't really distinguish between the two. You just see a thickened pericardium. The key thing to remember is that it's it may not involve the whole of the pericardium, it may involve just part of the pericardium. And sometimes it's difficult to distinguish, at least on CT, thickening from pericardial fluid sometimes, because it's really thin and you know, you're struggling to draw your region of interest and so on. Um, 
if it's slightly, I mean, I'll show you some uh, images of pericardial effusions because you can draw a region of interest and see if that's fluid or not. But when it's sort of just mildly thick and it's about four or five millimeters, it becomes difficult to draw that region of interest, right? And so you really don't know whether it's thickened or it's fluid, and that's where I think MR comes in quite beautifully because it kind of shows you fluid versus um, the, the pericardial layers. And the thickening of the pericardium may be in the context of acute, acute chronic, or recurrent setting. Right, now this is a chest x-ray, and I don't know if it projects well, but clearly the heart is big. But what am I trying to show you here? Yeah, it is basically um, a heart which is very globular, which is very round, right? So it's not just enlarged, it's quite round like that. So when you have a round, round looking heart, what's called a bo it's called a water bottle sign. I'm not quite sure why. I mean, I've never seen water bottles looking like that, but maybe there are water bottles that look like that. But it's a really round, enlarged heart. You have to think about pericardial effusions, right? Um, and this is what a pericardial effusion would look like. So basically what you've got is the, and it's a nice demonstration of anatomy. This is your epicardial fat. That's your coronary artery, the right coronary artery running in the epicardial fat. And then you've got the two layers of the pericardium that have split to give rise to this kind of appearance, right? Now, when it's like this, it's easy to distinguish between fluid and thickening because all you do is put a region of interest in there like you did for your coronary contrast um, assessment. And generally, as the radiologist would say, uh, would, would know that fluid has um, a low um, attenuation. So it will come up as 10 to 15 Hounsfield units or less than that. If you've got slightly thicker fluid, i.e. proteinaceous fluid, it'll be slightly higher um, than that, maybe about 20s or so. If it is even higher than that, about 40 to 50, then you're worried that there's probably going to be blood in there. So you get a rough idea about the contents of the fluid by drawing the region of interest in that uh, fluid. So, for example, here, if you draw a region of interest here, this, I think, was about 10 Hounsfield units. But here, you can see that it looks just a bit thicker. And there's a pleural effusion that looks also a little bit denser, right? So when you've got dense uh, fluid like that and you draw a region of interest in it, and I think this had about 40 Hounsfield units, this was actually a hemopericardium as well as a, um, a hemothorax in this patient. So dense-looking fluid suggests to you that there may be blood within it. And sometimes it's quite frank. So here, for example, that's the pericardial fluid, and then you, there is no mistaking the fact that there is actually a leak of contrast in, in here. And there's this tiny little hole here. So I think this is post-surgical um, trauma to the ventricle, and there was this sort of leak into the pericardium uh, in this patient. So what am I trying to show you here? Okay, so here you've got a biggish heart. You've got what looks like a right upper lobe opacity. So there's consolidation in the right upper lobe, and you've got fluid in both costophrenic recesses. So you've got pleural effusions. And this fluid has got this funny shape to it. It's got this funny sort of lentiform shape to it. And this patient had fever and chest pain and all that. And this is what the CT looks like. So in this case, you will find two things. You will find that there is a pericardial effusion and you've got a pleural effusion, right? But what you also find is that, sure, the visceral and parietal pleura have been split up, but there are loculations, there are pockets. So there are septations going on out here. And you've also got enhancement of the parietal and the visceral pleura. You also have some enhancement of, likewise, of the pericardial layers as well. So you can see everywhere that you've got thickening and smooth enhancement of the pericardial layers as well as of the pleural um, layers. And this patient, where there's a history of fever, there's a, hist there's a right upper lobe consolidation, there's an oculation of fluid, there is smooth enhancement of the pericardium, uh, sorry, of the pleural layers and stuff like that, that would suggest to you that this is something of infective etiology. So when you find enhancement and you find loculation, that always suggests some sort of inflammatory, could suggest some sort of inflammatory process, right? So again, you're looking at the findings and you're trying to correlate it with the clinical history as well. When you have pericardial effusions, the other thing that you're looking for is the signs of it sort of compressing something, you know, the hemodynamic effects of it. Now, here, for example, you've got a pericardial effusion, and what it's doing is that it's compressing the right atrium, and here it's compressing the right ventricle. And this is a case, uh, an extreme case, which is basically compressing the left AV groove and the left ventricle as well. 
So you're looking for hemodynamic effects of that pericardial effusion as well, right? So these are signs, if we see something like this, where we think that there is a pericardial effusion and it's compressing on the chambers, more likely to compress the right side of chambers than the left side of chambers, because it's much more compressible, I guess, then it is something that we would highlight to, to the cardiologist so that they can do an emergency echo and, and perhaps drain that pericardial fluid, right? This is not dynamic. We don't see all that atrial uh, diastolic collapse or ventricular collapse or whatever it is that you see on echo. But it's just understanding that when you see mass effect, it means that there is some sort of pressure building up within the pericardium. And the indirect signs of it is when you see compression of the right-sided cardiac chambers, abnormal contours of the right-sided cardiac chambers, dilatation of the SVC, IVC, and so on. This is another case that's trying to show an extreme sort of cardiac um, uh, pericardial tamponade. So I've shown you, shown you a whole sort of um, spectrum of cases really to build up an approach to it. So when you see pericardial effusion, you need to ask yourself, is this mild, moderate, or severe? There are no absolute cutoffs to it. You know, it's really a visual um, estimation of things. Uh, when I was learning it, I was told that, you know, I was taught that um, if it's less than one centimeter, it's mild. If it's between one to two centimeters, the height is moderate. And if it's more than two centimeters, it's severe. I'm not sure where that's come from, but I, I kind of eyeball it. And most of us would eyeball it and sort of tell you whether it's mild, moderate, or severe. You then need to also understand what is the consistency of that fluid, right? Is it just plain fluid, i.e. it's less than 10 to 15 hands per unit? Is it protonaceous fluid? When the hands, or is it hemorrhagic fluid, you know, and the Hansfeld units go up uh, accordingly. You need to bear in mind whether this could be possibly blood based on that. You also look for things like septations and loculations. Loculations are easy to see on CT because you can literally see little locules like I showed you. Septations are not that easy to pick up on CT, yeah. This is one thing, if they're really thick septations or calcified chronic septations, you may be able to see things. But if they're fine septations, you're not going to be able to see them that well on CT. The CT doesn't have that, uh, that you know, because these are really thin, that sort of special resolution to sort of support, uh, to, to tease out these septations. And I have to say that echo comes in quite handy in these cases, because you can see septations really beautifully on echo. You also need to ask yourself, is there any hemodynamic effects of this pericardial effusion? Uh, and is it associated with thickening, nodularity, enhancement, anything abnormal about the pericardium? CT is quite useful for guiding pericardial paracentesis as well. Uh, and we've done a few um, uh, in the unit, and it's quite useful to have CT at hand to see where your needle is going Go the other way. Now, when it comes to pericardial tamponade, just a word. I'm talking about fluid, but it may not necessarily be fluid. Like, this is a very florid case of pneumopericardium and pneumo. Uh, thorax, and you can see that the right ventricle is actually getting compressed by the pneumopericardium here. This is a pericardium where you can see clearly it's thickened, but it's not just thickened. There are little lumps and bumps in it, so it's nodular, and it's causing compression of the pericardium here, and so this is basically a malignant sort of uh, pericardial disease, but it has a with bilateral pleural effusions, and it's causing sort of compression of the right ventricle. And this is not a generalized global collection of fluid, which is what I've been showing you. This is like a localized collection of fluid, and it's possible both surgically to have some sort of localized collection of fluid or hematoma. And that can also cause compression of the uh, of the pericardium and the right ventricular, sorry, of the right ventricular, um, of the right ventricle as it shows here. So it's not necessarily just this uniform round collection of fluid that's going to cause the compromise um, of the chambers of the heart. Now that we're on the topic of pericardial compressive syndrome, so we've seen one, which is the tamponade, and then you have something which is called constrictive pericarditis. You can also have something called effusive constrictive pericarditis, where both coexist, but really essentially that would be more of a clinical assessment. But you can see constrictive pericarditis on, on CT. And um, this picture doesn't really show you um, a lot. What I was trying to show you was a calcified pericardium, but it hasn't come out very, very, I mean, maybe you can see a little bit of calcification here on, on the chest x-ray. But calcification is one of the beauty of CTs. You can pick up calcification so beautifully on CT. You struggle with that on MR, okay? Because essentially what you get is signal drop on MR, but you have lots of things called signal drop. So it's not easy to appreciate calcification unless you're really suspicious of it. But on CT, it stands out beautifully. So here, you know, you've got all this thickened pericardium, but it's also calcified. So, And you can also see the splitting of the two layers with a thin sliver of fluid within it. 
So this is what calcification of the pericardium would look like. And these are all different examples of, uh, or different sort of um, uh, non-contrast, contrast, and different planes of it. So this is calcified pericardium, which is basically um, uh, seen in multiple different planes of it. And it's causing constrictive pericarditis. The one thing I want you to remember is that these are just some of the figures that, that are kind of bandied around in literature, but 50% of calcified pericardium is associated with constricted pericarditis. And in patients with constricted pericarditis, they say 80% of them have calcified pericardium. I mean, in clinical practice, I, I think it's less than that. But the key thing to remember is the last sentence, that yes, if you've got calcified pericardium, you have to suspect constricted pericarditis and correlate it with um, clinical history and findings. But 20% of patients with constricted pericarditis have normal thickness non-calcified pericardium. And that is something that you need to bear in mind. And what are the signs of, this is again a fancy 3D um, picture of what calcified pericardium would look like. And this is something that's quite useful for surgeons when they're trying to do pericardiectomy because they like to know the extent of it and where they have to go and stuff like that. And the signs of constricted pericarditis, again, are indirect signs. So A, when you get thickened or calcified pericardium. B, when it's causing, I mean, here you can see, like, you know, there's this tubular, long, funny-looking, compressed right ventricle. There's right atrial dilatation. And then you may get dilated, dilated SVC, IVC, as well with reflux of contrast into the IVC, as we've seen in some of the previous cases. So again, these are indirect signs which are telling you that not indirect, yeah, I guess they're indirect in the sense that they're not, they're on static images that tell you that there is constricted pericarditis. If you have a full data set uh, from doing, for the full RR interval, you can actually run it and see the early diastolic inspiratory flattening of the, uh, certainly the early diastolic, not inspiratory because we asked them to hold the bed, but early diastolic flattening of the interventricular septum. But really hemodynamic assessment, which is a, like a CINE assessment, um, MR would be what you would do for it. But if you get thickened calcified pericardium like that, you know, um, that would sort of sway you as well towards constricted pericarditis. And then you have this picture, which I've shown you earlier, or a variation of this is, this is thickened, but it's not just smoothly thickened, it's nodular, it's lumpy and bumpy. There are lots of things that are happening in the adjacent pleural um, surface as well, and that looks ugly as well. So this is what malignant pericardial, this is malignant pericardial uh, involvement. So you can get enhancement, can be inflammatory or neoplastic. Thickening can be inflammatory or neoplastic. Nodular tends to be more neoplastic than inflammatory. Okay. So in effect, we've seen like a whole spectrum of abnormalities. So you can get thickening in the context of acute or chronic pericarditis. You can get pericardial effusion and then you, you kind of launch into that little stepwise approach of asking yourself how much is it what is it exactly? What does it contain? Does it have septations? Does it have loculations? Do you have pericardial thickening, enhancement, nodularity, and so on? You ask yourself whether there is any hemodynamic effects of it, i.e. whether there's any tamponade. Uh, you look for malignant manifestations, but you don't look at malignant manifestations in isolation, really. You know, you're, compa you, you're kind of looking at it in association with the other associated findings in the chest, as well as the clinical history. And then, of course, what uh, a little bit about the constricted pericarditis. There are some, some anatomical variants that you do need to be aware of where, before rushing into saying something is abnormal. So we have this thing called pericardial recesses, which are little collections of fluid in and around, which are usually around sort of blood vessels and so on. And the commonest ones that we have is the, a few of them that I've highlighted. So here, between the aorta and the pulmonary artery, you get this pericardial recess out here, which is a little tiny pocket of fluid that you tend to get here. Um, here, this is a common one that we see as a radiologist, which is called the superior pericardial recess. So this is basically a collection of fluid, which is posterior to the aorta that you can see. And, and there can be an anterior or lateral component to it as well, but commonly we tend to see it here. And it's important because sometimes it can be what's called a high-riding pericardial, uh, superior pericardial recess, which means that it's not, not just posterior to the ascending aorta, it kind of sort of runs along the paratrachea on the right side, so say for example here. And that's something, can, it can look quite, um, quite big and quite prominent, you know, and I'm, I, I've seen cases which have been followed up as, as lymph node when they weren't actually lymph nodes, so that is something that we need to be aware of. 
Um, even here, it's to the left of the pulmonary artery, you've got a little collection of fluid, but again, this is a pericardial recess. This is the one that I want you to focus on. So always you will find between the aorta and the pulmonary artery, you will have some sort of a fluid-filled structure or some sort of a pericardium there. When that is absent, this is what you get, right? Uh, or this is, this is an antimony. So this is basically congenital absence of the pericardium. Right? And when you have congenital absence of the pericardium, you get this extreme sort of lever rotation of the pericardium, which is where the apex also kind of <coughs> tends to drop down to the bottom. And what you've got to remember is that congenital absence may be complete or partial congenital absence. So the whole of the pericardium doesn't have to be absent. Like, for example, here, I'm telling you that there is an anterior pericardium because you can see that anterior pericardium. It's there's, <coughs> there's absence of the posterior pericardium in this patient. So you need to be aware that you can get congenital absence, which may be complete or partial. And this is the chest x-ray equivalent of what I was trying to tell you. Do you remember I told you that there is always fluid between, so this is your aorta and this is your pulmonary artery. There's usually a pericardial recess out here, so you never really see the lung dipping into that region because it can't. But when it does dip into that region, this is the CT equivalent of it. Or even here, I don't know if that's projecting well or not. When you have the lung interposed between the aorta and the pulmonary artery where there should be pericardial recess, uh, you need to suspect that there is congenital absence of the pericardium there. Okay. This is, again, when you look at the chest x-ray, um, it looks like there is cardiomegaly, and you will tell me, yes, there is cardiomegaly, but it's an abnormal, funny kind of contour on the right side out here. This is just a lateral um, chest x-ray trying to show you the same thing. And this is a CT equivalent of it, exact CT equivalent of it. So what you've got is a la large right lesion out here. When you put your cursor onto it, it's about 10 ounces per unit. So you know it's fluid. Um, and this is what is a pericardial cyst, right? It's the most common benign pericardial mass, so to say, and it's a congenital thing. Um, and the commonest position where you see it is in the right cardiophrenic angle here. That is the commonest position. It's not to say that you don't see it elsewhere, but this is the commonest position that you tend to see it in. This is another chest x-ray, and you can see, again, that something's not normal about the contour of the heart. So, of course, you've got scoliosis, but this left heart border is not really normal. There's a lumpy, bumpy appearance to it. And this is a CT, which is showing you another cyst out here. And this cyst has got calcification, it's fluid attenuation, there's a little bit of thickening within it. So my point is that not all things that are there in the cardiophrenic angles are pericardial cysts. This turned out to be a thymic um, um, cyst. But the important thing is to remember that you can get uh, fluid-filled structures uh, related to the pericardium. And the commonest thing that you have in that case is um, a pericardial cyst. And this is really what I was talking about. When you're looking for calcification, CT is beautiful. I mean, it just shows it to you without any, any um, doubts at all. MR is really more for, not so much for the morphology, but it's more to do with the dynamics of it, you know, to look for constrictive pericarditis, to look for the, the uh, inspiratory early diastolic um, flattening of the, uh, or reversal of the interventricular septum, and so on. So MR is really more for assessment of the physiology, and CT can be used for it if you have a full RR interval. We've kind of moved away from full RR intervals, so CT is really for the morphological assessment of the pericardium now. So this is just a little flavor of pericardial diseases, and then we've got cardiac masses, and I'm just going to give you a flavor of it, because if you look at the textbook, there's so many, so many different types of cardiac masses. And I think if you're in, in, in a center where they deal with cardiac tumors and stuff, you may see that, that spectrum. But essentially, there are a few things that you need to be aware about cardiac masses. And I'm just going to give you a really basic thing about cardiac masses. Goodness. So when I'm talking about cardiac masses, I'm just going to briefly sort of talk about pericardial masses. You know, I showed you the lumpy, bumpy bits as well. The commonest thing that affects the pericardium is pericardial metastases, right? And the most common primary malignant tumor of the pericardium is pericardial mesotheliomas, and they tend to be associated with the hemorrhagic pericardial effusion. And then you can have a whole host of other things that can affect the pericardium. When it comes to cardiac masses, 
a few pointers and a few things to remember and this is really about the basic principles of assessment of cardiac masses. It's not about going into all the histological details about all of them. But what you need to remember is that it's more common to have secondary cardiac masses, i.e. secondary to a malignancy elsewhere as opposed to a primary cardiac mass. But when you do get a primary cardiac mass, actually benign is more common than a malignant primary cardiac mass. And this is something that you need to remember. And as always, there's always a big list of cardiac masses. You need to remember just the top three of most of them, right? So, for example, when I said to you that benign cardiac masses are more common than malignant, in adults, the most common benign cardiac masses that you're likely to come across, it's not to say that you won't come across the others, but the most common ones are myxomas, lipomas, and papillary fibroelastomas. So I'll show you some pictures of that. Whereas in children, it's more likely that it's going to be a rhabdomyoma or that it's more likely to be like a fibroma or a teratoma. Okay. So the spectrum is there and it's, there are some things which are more common in adults as compared to children. So the rhabdomyoma is more common in children, whereas myxomas, lipomas and papillary fibroelastomas are more common in adults. And how do they present? I mean, sometimes they can present as embolization of the tumor or the adjacent thrombus adjacent to the tumor. Sometimes they can present as a mass effects, so you can have obstruction of the valves or the outflow tracts. And sometimes they can present as arrhythmias as well. But it all, life all starts for us with an echo, right? You guys do an echo, you see something, and then you say, um, you know, this is, um, please can you assess this further? The common thing, one of the commonest things that you need to bear in mind is differentiation of tumor versus mass. And this is something that comes up fairly often in your clinical practice. Is this a tumor or is this a mass? Yeah. Sometimes you find that, for example, here, there is this hypoechoic structure here. It's associated with thing of the, of the myocardium and calcification of the myocardium. So this is like an infarct, an old infarct, and there is this sort of crescentic shaped structure next to it, and this is more likely to be a, a thrombus, partly because of the context of it, partly because of the setting in which it is, i.e. adjacent to a calcified infarcted myocardium, partly because of the fact that it's crescentic in shape. Um, and therefore, you can be fairly confident that this is a, a mass, uh, sorry, a, a thrombus, and then you have this, and this is another common thing that will come that you will come across, where on echo there is a suspicion uh, it's a thrombus, maybe not, and then you're asked to do uh, an MR uh, uh, to it comes down to the radiology department to rule out a left atrial appendage thrombus. And um, I think uh, Tarun sort of talked to you a little bit about it, and I've told you that when you're walking through your heart, make sure you look at your right and left atrial appendages. So what, how do you differentiate a thrombus and from what is called, the commonest thing is the flow artifact, right? Because there is flow mixing with the contrast. And so you get this, this sort of filling defect in the left atrial appendage. You can go by the morphology of it. Um, you can try and assess it by the morphology of it. So if you find that the bottom of it seems to be sort of bulging out like a, like a, globular thing, it's more likely to be some sort of a tumor sitting there rather than a thrombus. Mm -hmm. If it's more flat or like a graded appearance to it, then it's more likely to be a flow-related artifact with this. And um, when you get this kind of a request, you have to bear in mind that you have to give some time. If it is a flow-related artifact, and you're like, there's a request that comes through saying echo, query, left atrial thrombus, we're not sure. If you do it as you do a normal coronary CT angiogram, uh, i.e. you time it off your um, aorta, it may be too early for that left atrial filling to occur, right? Particularly when you've got patients with atrial fibrillation or patients with a dilated left-sided um, chambers where it takes time for the contrast to get into the left atrium. What we do in our unit is if it is saying you know, I'm, I want to rule out left atrial thrombus, and that's what I want to rule out, and I'm not sure whether it's there. We do a delayed scan, but a delayed scan, what I mean is that we time it to about 50 to 60 seconds, and we go for it. The question is not coronaries, yeah? The question is not um, coronaries. It's just, can you please make sure that there's no left atrial appendage thrombus? So in that case, we would time it, and we would do it a 50 to 60 second delay. That's literally tell the radiographer, at 50 to 60 seconds, you go, right? And what tends to happen is the scan is not as pretty as in coronary CT angiograms in the sense that you don't have that dense contrast. 
but you have uniform contrast, and that is what the key is. Because if you have a uniform contrast of the left atrial appendage, you've kind of ruled out a thrombus, right? The tricky thing is that if they say, I don't know whether this is tumor or thrombus, then you're kind of stuck a little bit. So in that case, we modify it because then you have to sort of make sure that there's no tumor as well, right? Um, and so in that case, what we tend to do is we tend to do um, an arterial phase, like a coronary CT angiogram, and then we do a delayed phase, right? And the delayed phase can just be a limited delayed phase just to that left atrial appendage. So you plan those two scans. The arterial phase is to look for arterial enhancement in case it's a thrombus. And the delayed phase is that to make sure that that um, if it is not a thrombus, if it's not a tumor and it is a thrombus, what you will find then is that in the arterial phase, even if there's flow-related artifact on the delayed phase, it should clear up, right? So this is how we tend to do it. <clears throat> so thrombi um, is one of the commonest things that you would be asked to rule out. So you need to bear in mind that when you ask to rule out thrombi, you may need to do a delayed phase um, at about 50 to 60 seconds. This is the commonest sort of tumor that you come across, the commonest benign cardiac tumor that you come across in adults, and this is a myxoma, right? So there's a whole load of things that are, you know, that I've just literally picked up from uh, from the textbook. So most of the times they're left atrial, most of the times they're solitary, um, and this is when you know, like, what the characteristic thing about that though is that this is your interatrial septum, and if you remember the fossa ovalis, and you guys are all now experts at looking at the fossa ovalis and PFOs, it seems to be attached to that fossa ovalis, right? So that's a very characteristic appearance of this. Mm -hmm. And um, what, you, what you need to bear in mind with these is that sometimes they can, they can be quite large, they can be quite mobile, they can prolapse through the mitral valves. And I think there's a case that we will hopefully show you where it's actually prolapsing. And I think this is just a still short of that, it's prolapsing through your uh, mitral valve out here. You can get calcification within it as well, right, with myxomas. And so with myxomas as well, what we tend to do is, you know, like if it's myxoma versus thrombus, I mean, in this case, it's so typically a myxoma because it's so attached to that, that for, you know, that, that thin membrane that it can't really be a thrombus. I guess there could be a thrombus attached to it, but this is not primarily a thrombus. But if we have something like that, and if you're not sure of it's an atypical location, and you can see myxomas in atypical locations, you can see it in the right atrium, you can see it away from the fossa valis. And what we tend to do is we tend to do a non-contrast scan. We tend to do an arterial phase and a delayed phase, right? The non-contrast will show us calcification. And the arterial phase, it may or may not enhance. Generally, it tends not to enhance, but it does enhance in the delayed phases, right? And so that kind of shows us that this is a myxoma. Trombi are not expected to enhance on the delayed phases, right? So that is how you would differentiate between a myxoma and a thrombus. That if you have a thrombus, it doesn't enhance in the delayed phases at all. And so it's more likely to be uh, a myxoma. You can characterize tumors as well. You know, like one of the strengths of MRs is meant to be that you can do tissue characterization. Oh, yeah, you know, you can do this and you can do those sequences and that sequences and you can characterize tissues. You can characterize tissues as well to a certain extent with the CT as well. And like, say, for example, here, if you remember, I told you anything that's dark gray is kind of fat. So this is fat, right? On MR, you would do all your fat suppression sequences and you will suppress the fat and you will very confidently say this is fat. Here, I would put a region of interest in that. And if it's a minus sort of uh, Hounsville units and not very low minus Hounsville units, then I would say that this is fat. So air and fat are minus Hounsville units, but air is really minus thousands, whereas fat is minus you know, in, in, in less than hundreds or stuff. So I would look at it and say it's dark gray. I would do a region of interest in it and say, oh, this looks like fat. And then I would say this is some sort of a fatty lesion, right? And depending on its location, you then start scratching your head and asking yourself, what kind of a fatty lesion could it be? So this is one of the commonest things that you would see. It's smack bang against the interatrial septum, right? So uh, as opposed to a myxoma that I showed you, which is attached to that fossa ovalis, which, as I told you, will enhance particularly with delayed, con uh, delayed enhancement sequence, uh, with a delayed CT scan, this is literally along the interatrial septum. And this is what's known as lipomatous hypertrophy of the interatrial septum. 
So an echo, it's meant to measure more than two centimeters or whatever it is. It has a characteristic dumbbell shape sometimes because you have fat on the top of the uh, on the top half of the intertial septum and at the bottom half part of the intertial septum. And the fossil valves is thin, so it looks like a dumbbell shape as well. So if it measures more than two centimeters and its maximum diameter, it's dumbbell shaped. It's a fatty attenuation. You would call it lipomatous hypertrophy of the intertial septum. Yeah. It's an interesting word, a phrase, because it's none of these, actually, if you really go to look at it. It's called a lipoma, but it's not a lipoma, because a lipoma usually has its own capsule. This doesn't have its capsule. A lipoma histologically is made of white fat cells. This is made of brown fat. What is brown fat? Yeah, she obviously reports pen. Yeah. Brown fat is what is meant to be in hibernating animals, you know, where, where it protects them from the winter, and we are supposed to have evolved from it, and, and we don't seem to have a lot of it. But the people who report pet will tell you that we do have a lot of it, you know, and especially. Um, so, what is the difference between white fat and brown fat? This is histologically what white fat is there's a big globule of fat, and there's a tiny nucleus pushed out to the periphery. With brown fat, you have tiny little white droplets uh, droplets of fat, and you have a lot of mitochondrium. Because of the mitochondrium, it looks like brown fat, and therefore it's called brown fat, but it's the mitochondria that generate the heat and keep you warm, right? And you tend to see them, and the important thing about this is to know uh, and to be aware of this is because it lights up on PET. It's really hot on PET because it's metabolically very active, right? And then winter time, and I'm sure you know the people who report PET will tell you, you see all this increased uptake in symmetrically around the neck and the supraclavicular fossa and in the midline on either sides of the midline in adult human beings as well. This is all sort of brown fat, right? And the important thing is that in the context of malignancy, we've had this. People saying, oh, there's this thing in the heart and it lights up. No, that's just brown fat from a lipomatous hypertrophy. So you need to be aware of that, right? This is another one where I was talking about tissue characterization, again, dark gray, again, minus Hounsfall units, and this is also fatty, but it's not along the intentional septum, right? And this is the MR equivalent of it, where you've got sort of fat suppression sequences that show you that it's fat. And this is essentially a lipoma, okay? And then the third common thing that I told you behind tumor is a papillary fibroelastoma. So this is something that you can see on the tip of the aortic valve leaflets. You can also see it uh, in relation to the papillary muscles as well. We've certainly seen them um, in the left ventricle uh, attached to papillary muscle. So it's this well-defined globular structure sitting on the tip of the aortic valve leaflets. And it doesn't really sort of... Um, I've never really seen it enhancing convincingly um, um, on CT. And you were going to say, well, how do you know it's not a vegetation? I don't know that it's not a vegetation. It's a clinical history, right? It's a clinical history, the characteristic appearance, the characteristic location of it that will kind of convince you. Histologically, that's what it's supposed to look like. These are meant to be little fronds of connective tissue with, with vascular structures running through it. This is a CT which is showing you florid enhancement and calcification in this patient. Uh, sorry, it's, it's calcification in this uh, apical lesion. But we can't really characterize it any further on MR. You know, like it's meant to be low signal on T1 and T2, and this is actually a fibroma with vascularity and calcification within it. This is something I think Tarun was going to show you, and we've seen a couple of examples of this. There's mitral annular calcification, but it's like, it's like an extreme case of mitral annular calcification. It's what we call as caseous necrosis of the mitral annulus, uh, mitral annular calcification. And essentially what it is is that it's liquefactive coagulative necrosis that's going on. It's called caseative because of, you can see caseous material within it, but it's not related to TB. And on surgical, you know, when they try and take it out surgically, it's literally like a, a toothpaste. It, it comes out, it has the consistency and the appearance of, of toothpaste. <coughs> Nobody really quite knows why it happens, but it's seen more, most commonly in hypertensive elderly women, maybe seen sometimes in patients with renal failure. And uh, does it cause any effects? Well, it can cause mass effect, you know, and it can restrict the movement of your mitral valve leaflet. There are case reports of it rupturing and, and getting into the left ventricle and causing stroke, but these are just case reports of it. Um, and uh, from your perspective, what you need to know is that it is white, 
on a non-contrast scan and it's white on the contrast scan as well. And you think, oh my goodness, why is it, is it enhancing the contrast? I think it's the fact that it's so white to start off with that it looks quite sort of florid on, on, a, non, on a contrast CT as well. And from your perspective, all you need to make sure is that you've traced the circumflex artery, which is going adjacent to it in the left AV groove, and make sure it's not some rip-roaring aneurysm of the circumflex artery. So you need to just follow the circumflex artery and make sure that it's not actually an aneurysm of the circumflex artery or anything of that sort, right? But it's just so characteristic in its appearance, it's unlikely. And then my last couple of slides is really the malignant cardiac tumors. So we talked about benign cardiac tumors. And then the malignant cardiac tumors... Metastasis tends to be way, way, way more common than primary malignant cardiac tumors. And it's commonly from the lung and the breast because those are locally situated. But melanomas, lymphomas, leukemias, they all have uh, a tendency to go sit in the heart as well. So you have to look at the heart and you have to look at the heart chambers and the myocardium because suddenly you'll find that the myocardium is, is nicely, you follow it and then suddenly it becomes round and then kind of follows again normally. So when you see these abnormal contours in the myocardium or abnormal masses in the myocardium, and sometimes they don't always light up with contrast, you know, because these are arterial phase scans that we're doing, and sometimes they light up with a delayed phase scan. But if you see that abnormal little bumpy contour to the myocardium, you need to suspect metastases, and we picked up a few. And the next time you go and do your chest CTs as well, look at the heart and the oncology thing. You'll be surprised at how often Every once in a while, well, I shouldn't say very often, but every once in a while you will pick up metastases from a melanoma or a lymphoma or a leukemia or something. And even colorectal cancers, we picked up some in, in the myocardium. So secondary to malignancies elsewhere is way, way more common than primaries. If you have primaries, and again, I've just given you a flavor of things because you will have a whole long list, but what you need to remember is that sarcomas are the commonest primary cardiac tumors. In adults, it tends to be angiomyosarcomas. In children, it tends to be fibromyosarcomas, right? And in 5% of the cases, it could be a primary cardiac lymphoma, right? So just top threes and everything, right? So, uh, as I said to you, malignant um, secondaries are more common than uh, malignant primaries, okay? So this is an example of an angiomyosarcoma of the heart. So you can clearly see that there is this horrible looking mass. It's kind of going out. It's lumpy. It's bumpy. It's, it's infiltrating into the adjacent sort of uh, pericardiac fact. That's an associated uh, pericardial effusion, maybe a pleural effusion as well here. Um, this is just trying to show you how it's kind of eaten away into the right atrium and the surrounding structures. There's associated sort of uh, pulmonary nodules, interlobular septum thickening, pleural effusions, all which are sort of pointing towards malignancy. This is another florid case where you've got this mass which is eaten away into the right atrium. There's associated pleural effusions. Um, so again, and then the lungs sort of um, look very nodular to me. This is again uh, something similar, right? You know, in the sense that you've got all this soft tissue just infiltrating around the heart, into the heart, particularly the right sided chambers. But what surprisingly you see is that the right coronary artery is encased by it, it's not infiltrated by it. So when you have encasement, you're thinking more in terms of lymphoma, right? The general principles are the lymphomas encase and tumors infiltrate. Right. So this is where the right coronary artery is still intact in, in the midst of all this mass. And then you have this pericardial thickening, enhancement, effusions, you've got consolidation. This was actually a, a cardiac lymphoma. And this is um, a case that um, I first saw actually when I was with Tarun. Uh, and since then I've become, we, know we saw about three cases re in, in Toronto. And everyone's like, what is it? And I said, I know what this is. And I was thanking you when that happened recently. But um, this is a subcranial sort of lesion, which has this nodular characteristic enhancement with the central low attenuation within it. And this is a pheochromocytoma. You can get pheochromocytomas everywhere. You know, you can get them in the mediastinum. You can get them in relation to the heart. Um, and I've seen them in different locations now. And I just had a run of them. Um, and these are meant to be some nuclear scans to show positive <laughs> uh, studies. Um, and this, uh, this is just an angio to show the vascularity of it. And I've shown you a picture of this. This is a sarcoma of the pulmonary arteries that I just wanted to sort of uh, bring to your attention, uh, that when you have filling defects in, in any structure, 
before you rush to call it a thrombus, make sure that it is not extending beyond, make sure that it's not enhancing with contrast, make sure that it's not sort of crossing boundaries. Because when it does that, then it's not a thrombus. You know, so this is a pulmonary artery sarcoma rather than a thrombus. So again, it's just a flavor, just the top three lists of other things. But as long as you remember that um, um, <coughs> secondary malignant tumors are more common than primary, and as long as you remember that of the benign uh, cardiac tumors, myxomas, lipomas, and papillary fibroelastomas are more common in adults, or abdominal is more common in pediatric population. And as long as you remember that of the primary cardiac tumors, it's the angiomyosarcs which are more common adults and fibromyosarcs which are more common in children and don't forget cardiac lymphomas as well yeah thank you